programming is brought to you by Local Video Marketing. In association with CoachChick.com Now we have full ice drill, once again zero, starting from the both sides at the same time. Player number three, for, for example, goes forward and he receives a pass. He made a curve here on the blue line. Now he's got a puck, he goes with, with a puck straight on, he plays a pass on the player number one. Now he goes this way and he receives a pass like this. After he received this pass, he goes once again zero, takes a shot. This is the first drill, very easy one for a warm up of the goalies because we have shooting from the left and from the right side. Now we update this drill. Once again zero, we do the second version. The player number one goes straight on and he receives a pass from the player number five. As soon as he received his pass, he goes this way. Now he plays a pass to the player number three and continues this way. Now he receives a pass. He takes a puck, speed up, speed up, and take a shot. After he took a shot, here in the corner are pucks. He goes into the corner, he takes a puck. Now came player number three this way. He received a pass from this player. This player goes in the front of the net for a screen and this player number three takes a shot. So we have two shots, four players working at the same time. It's a very great drill. Now we have drill, once again zero plus defender, the blues are defenders, the reds are forwards. This drill is actually for minimum 18 players, we need 8 defenders each corner too. We start with blue defender number one, he goes with a puck straight on in the front of the net and he plays a puck on the player number one. The player number one received this, this pass, goes into the middle and he plays a pass on the player number four. As soon as he played, he goes like this, he receives a pass, he goes on the net and he takes a shot. The blue defender is still skating over here, so the, the blue defender played a pass, he's still skating, he's still skating. As soon as this pass is played, the first player stays in the front of the net so actually we have here this player in the front of the net player number four timing we want to see timing this player comes over here and he receives a pass from the defender number two so he can take a second shot defender this one this one is still skating over here and now we have one player in the front of the net the the second shoot at and now defender received a pass from this corner and he takes a third shot so actually very quickly drill a lot of shots not so tough drill very quickly and I think also very useful now we have simple drill once again zero 
the forward number one place a pass to the D number one D number one moving to the side and he plays the pass from here to this forward this forward moving into the middle very quickly stored very quickly fits now he plays a pass on the forward number five the forward number five is looking the forward number one is here pass back and now we have situation once again zero against this D so he took a puck and he tries to beat the defender in situation once again zero this drill is from both sides heads up some passes some shooting and try to play to goal of course depends on how many players you have on the ice because if you have 20 it's not so much time or there is the time enough but uh, it takes so much of time to take this drill for our players minimum five or six times now we have drill two against one the defender number one goes behind the net with a puck and he looks for, for a pass and he plays this pass on the player number one this player number one goes forward like this with a puck we need timing we need player number two coming this way I show it like this I show it with a blue color the player number two went this way and as soon as he's got a puck we need movement over here now the player or forward number one plays a pass here is a defender he's ready to receive a pass now we see both forwards both forwards crossing over reorganization in neutral zone and we see them going two against one this way against this defender as soon as as soon as the defender play the pass move me moving he resize a pass shot and now the next situation from the other side so he goes down he resize a pass from this defender and he plays the pass over here and we can go that same way like before Hi there, and welcome back to another episode of Hockey Nutrition with Kim. Today, I'm sharing with you module three from my self-paced Create Your Skaters Meal Plan Template Workshop to help your skater eat, skate, win. Today's agenda, we are going to cover when to eat the pre-skate and recovery snacks and why timing matters, how much to eat and why, the importance of a pre-skate snack and a recovery snack, and you're going to get some examples of how to create your skaters pre-skate and recovery snacks. So moving forward, you will be able to create them for your skater and have them ready to go. What time is the pre-skate snack? You want to think of the pre-skate snack as 30 minutes before ice time. This is the time when your skater is literally topping off their tank before they step on the ice. You could think of this as equivalent to topping off your tank in your car before you take a long trip. You don't want to run out of gas just in case you're on a stretch of highway that doesn't have an exit sign for a filling station. And you certainly don't want your skater to run out of speed when they're going into the third period or maybe even into overtime. 30 minutes before ice time, you want to think of fast digesting carbohydrates. Your body does not have time to break down protein and fat and help your skater feel good when they get on the ice. Now is certainly not the time for a heavy meal or a heavy snack. So some ideas for a pre-skate snack would be seven to 10 mini pretzel twists, one fruit leather. I've shown you a box here. You could buy a box very inexpensively and take it and have it for the team, say in between games. 
two rice cakes. Uh, you don't want to choose the cheddar ones. And then one go-go squeeze tube. Now a recovery snack, you want to aim for 15 minutes after ice time. And I know this is quick, but the quicker your skater gets the food in their belly, the quicker their body begins the repair process. So we're going to think of carbohydrates first. Hockey is a stop and go sport and it's fueled by carbohydrates. In an hour of playing, your skater can lose more than half of their glycogen stores. And these glycogen stores need to be replenished before they step back on the ice. As well, they need a small amount of lean protein to help build and repair and maintain their muscle tissue that they use during their hard practice or hard game. So an example would be eight to 12 ounces of a low fat chocolate milk, and then a fruit strip, it could be a bagel, some other type of carbohydrate, it could be a piece of fruit, but the milk being the lean protein and then some carbohydrates. Now you wanna think of carbohydrates first because you're having three times as much carbohydrates as protein. So what does that mean? So if they're eating something that's 24 grams of carbohydrates, they're going to want to have eight grams of protein. And this is actually figured out based on their weight and their level of play. But a general rule of thumb is it's a three to one ratio of carbohydrates to protein when you're thinking of the recovery snack. So think carbohydrates first and then add in a little protein. Now go create your skaters pre-skate and recovery snack. And if you'd like to learn more about youth ice hockey nutrition, you can visit www.hockeymomrd.com or you could feel free to email me at hockeymomrd at gmail.com. Please type hockey nutrition in the subject line. I wish your skater much success on the ice and happy skating till next time. Hey, good morning guys. Dave Schmitz, resistancebandtraining.com. Welcome to the band gym today. Yeah, I have a band gym training minute for you today. Absolutely, it's, actually it's going to be a series of minutes that I want to share with you based on a question I asked many of you several weeks ago. All right? And that is, if you had one question you could ask me in regards to band training, what would it be? And hands down, the number one response was, can band training do what free weights do? And the answer is yes. But, yeah, there's always a but. But what is the goal? And in many of the cases that you guys were talking about, the goal was, can it build strength and muscle? So the answer is yes. But once again, the key is how you implement it and how you use bands to train. There's some unique things that you have to do when training with bands that makes the difference between being able to build muscle and strength and not go ahead and have success. That's what I want to go ahead and talk to you today about. Let's go ahead and let's break it down and let's get into today the number one key to building strength and muscle using bands versus free weights. All right, let's go ahead and break down the number one key in my mind to building strength and muscle with bands versus weights. Key is this, you need to understand the difference between the resistance. A dumbbell, constant resistance, keeps the muscle on tension at all times. Therefore, you go ahead and feel the muscle working all the time. With bands, the resistance is variable. That means it's going to change as you are going through the movement. However, the great thing about a variable resistance is you're going to be able to do a lot of other things to help build muscle, which we'll talk about later. But if you're strictly looking at how to go ahead and compare dumbbells to free weights, excuse me, dumbbells or free weights to bands, you want to go ahead and look at the tension. In order for me to build muscle with the band, I'm going to go have to going to have to keep tension on the system at all times. And that's where the problem lies with most people that are trained with bands. They don't keep the tension on. 
Let me use an example, simple bicep curl, simple hammer curl. My feet are narrow. You can see that I don't have any tension on the band right now. So until I get to here, there's no tension. All right, I need to make sure that the tension starts immediately from my hands to my foot. So that means I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna widen my feet out with this particular exercise, make sure when I grasp the band, I've already got tension on it. Yeah, from my hand to my foot, I've already got tension. So I have tension through the full range of motion. That's the key. You must go ahead and make sure there's tension on the system throughout the whole range of motion so you keep tension on the muscle through the whole range of motion. Let me give you another example of that that I think really shows it clearly. Pulling is a perfect example, all right? Very often when I see people pulling, all right, what I will see is them starting in this position. Well, there's no tension on the band. It's loose right here. The reason it's like that, probably they have too big a band, meaning they know they can't, when they go to pull, they can't finish the movement, so they start closer so they can finish the movement. The problem is I'm only getting tension from about this part of the range of motion to here. The muscle is never going to contract the way it should. The beauty of bands is that it's going to take the muscle into a lengthened position if you let it. So let's stretch the band out and now go through a range. Hey, the band is still have tension on it and I'm lengthening. That's the perfect contraction because now I've loaded the muscle, all right, with the tension on the band, and it's ready to contract and squeeze. Compared to a dumbbell, where I'm going ahead, and yes, it's down here, but there's no, gonna be no tension change from there to here. As a result, the muscle is not going to get that stimulus of being lengthened and then having to squeeze harder and harder and harder through the range of motion. That's the beauty of band training. But the key is you must keep the tension on the band at all times, which means that you must choose a band that number one, keeps tension on the system at all times, but also challenges you. All right, so that's the key to it. Now, here's the problem, all right? You need to pick the right band. Because if you pick a too light a band, all right, what's going to happen is you're going to probably overstretch it to get the amount of tension you need at the end of the range. If you choose too big a band, we've already talked about that, you're not going to keep it on tension and therefore you're not going to get that lengthening effect that you want right before you contract. Pick your band wisely. The other thing is you want a system that has some length to it. This is very important. Some people ask, well, Dave, why do I need pairs of bands? Well, because often you want to use a system that is at least 41 inches long. Sometimes you'll even see me double it up and use this system to create even a longer system. Why do I do that? Because the longer the system, the more variability I have in, this, in, the, in the resistance that's being uh, recruited and used. Also, it allows me to always make sure that I can hit the end range on both sides. Some people, will, you go ahead and take a band and they'll hook it up and they'll start with a short system like this. The problem with that is at this point, point right here, there's nothing on the system. As I go to pull, I can't finish it. So as a result, I have to start closer so I can pull it. A shorter system is not going to provide you the variability and resistance to create the effect that I just talked to you about, which is keeping the tension on the system both at the beginning and the end. So guys, number one key to building strength, building muscle, but also maximizing your resistance band training success is keep the tension on. Yeah, keep the tension on the system. I'll come back with you, with you in the future and help you build even more keys to going ahead and building strength and muscle. But for right now, let's keep the tension on the system, let's pick the right size band, and let's get to work.
everybody. My name is Shawnee Harley. I'm a two-time Olympian and mental toughness coach. And here is your mental toughness tip for today. Here's the quote. When you get squeezed, what's inside comes out. What in the world does that mean? Well, it means this. When you squeeze an orange, Think about what comes out, orange juice. Yeah, it's not like you squeeze an orange and then apple juice comes out. You're like, what the heck? Where did apple juice come from? It's not how it works. When we get squeezed, what's inside comes out. I want you to think about for yourself, if you're an athlete, if you're a parent, if you're a coach, what happens to you when you get squeezed? And what does squeezed mean? Anytime you feel pressure, anytime you feel stress, anytime you feel anxious, anytime you feel nervous, anytime you feel self-conscious, anytime you feel embarrassed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what squeezed means. When we, were, when we are under duress, nervous, anxious, fearful, all of the things, our outsides will always match our insides. What does that mean? Well, what that means is when we give athletes, when athletes, when you try to tell yourself, I'm just going to fake it till I make it, or just get over it, or just get out there and be confident. Don't worry about it. Oh, how about this one? Just let it go. What does that even mean? Just let it go. What, let your nerves go? Let your anxiety go? If that's so easy, how come nobody can freaking let it go? The reason is we haven't handled the root of the problem. We do not change behavior by addressing the behavior. We must go underneath. We must see what's driving the behavior, what's causing it. Where is the fear coming from? Where is the anxiety coming from? Where are the nerves coming from? Where is the self-doubt coming from? Until we go underneath and we see what's driving it, what's causing these feelings, we will not be able to successfully handle them. I'm going to tell you what else I know from experience happened to me. And it happens to all of the athletes that I coach. When you fake it, when you hide from how you truly feel on the inside, you know what happens? You get squeezed. And at the most inopportune time, what's inside comes out. Think about standing on the free throw line. Your team's down two with eight seconds to go. Do you think at that moment with eight seconds to go and you feel the fear, you're going to be like, oh, I know what to do with this fear. No, you won't. Because handling how we feel is a skill. When we practice it, we get better. Another analogy is we do not prepare for the storm in the storm. It's too late. We prepare for the storm before the storm. The storm is coming, whether you want it to or not. Mental toughness is about handling your insides, facing your feelings. That's what emotional intelligence is. So that when the storm comes and you get squeezed, Instead of fear coming out, instead of nerves, anxiety, self-doubt, what would it be like when you got squeezed if courage came out? How often have you felt like you've been wasting your time trying to connect with new customers? Aren't you also tired of not being sure which way to turn for more attention? Now, here's some great news for sure. Video is the best way to get your message out there. Better yet, there are even more effective ways nowadays to attract attention and hold it longer than you ever have before. No more having site visitors leave your website after only a few seconds. 
With a virtual assistant like me, you can say goodbye to such concerns, mainly because your visitors will love the help we can provide. Just let Dennis and Brenda tell you all about interactive video or conversational marketing. And let them tell you more about my colleagues and me. Start getting more leads and sales right now by using the nearby link. As I wind down in these specificity-oriented videos, I'm discovering something. In a way, there are two paths to training for a skill. Of course, we have to treat the movements involved in the given skill, or what some might call biomechanics. In the videos I've done so far, I've only talked about the actual mechanics a little mainly because I could spend an hour just studying something like the skating stride. For the sake of this series, I've spent the bulk of my time sharing ideas about the way given skills are most often used in the heat of battle. Considering those paths to our coaching, I feel the same is true of our approach to shooting. Frankly, I think places like youtube.com are loaded with help on mechanics. And while I've found a few so-called gurus afar off when it comes to the sciences, most advice out there is pretty good. Where I feel I can help most is in suggesting ideas on how coaches might achieve the best results from their drills, as well as how they can help their players better prepare for the craziness of a helter-skelter game. And I think no skill deserves more thought when it comes to readying for the heat of battle than shooting. Picture something, if you would. How often does a player get to stand prettily and take a perfect shot? Not very often, huh? Yet, while we do need to sometimes work on that skill under such conditions, that kind of drilling hardly readies a player for the heat of battle. Now picture something else, because I'm going to suggest that the best scorers in our game can pull the trigger under the worst of conditions, maybe while being held by a defender, maybe while being forced far off balance, or maybe while only being able to use one hand or one leg for leverage. So okay, Let's take a step back for a minute or so and let me share my thoughts on practicing shooting technique. Although there's nothing wrong with having players skate from a line, move on the goaltender, fire their shot, and then return to line, there are a couple of things I see wrong with practicing that way too often. Number one, it takes forever for a player to go from the back of a line to the front. Worse yet, a player doesn't get a chance to perfect a movement in this way if he can't try once, think and feel what that was like, and then try the movement again. Think about what I just said there, because the best way to refine a movement, like a shot, is to do six or seven in a row, make adjustments each time, take a short break, and then go back at it again. Then, when I want my players to work on their shots on the go, I'll use the same setup and have them circle a short distance to shoot while they're moving. I can even have pairs of players feed each other for shots off a pass or for screening and deflecting. Okay, as for getting our players ready for the nature of their game, let's consider something I said earlier. 
So, once a player is able to shoot fairly well in a practice setting, we need to create situations that help him shoot under the most difficult of conditions. And to me, that usually means taking away the player's leverage or forcing him to shoot without being in perfect balance. I do all sorts of things here, including having my players jog while shooting, I have them hop on both feet, one or the other, I have them shoot from their knees or while seated, or even while having a teammate hold them or gently beat on them. Then, going back to a theme I've brought up often in this series on specificity, I hope my friends here now understand how each of the building blocks affect the others. I hope you might sense that the game-like drills you do in skating help the game-like skills required in puck handling, passing, and shooting. And I hope it also makes sense that asymmetric type work done in puck handling will eventually help your players be more dangerous shooters. Okay, I have some other ideas to continue on specificity. However, I'm also ready to swing towards something else should members just let me know. This has been a local video marketing production. We hope you've enjoyed this, and that you've picked up a number of great hockey tips. Please do tell some friends about these shows, and let the contributing coaches know how much you appreciate them.